I'll take our seats and uh, uh, get ready for our uh, very interesting event. Today we had some kind of a treat for the uh, MSA. We've organized this event to bring together a few people to discuss the uh, very serious but important topic of Uyghurs currently facing persecution in China. So, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank some of our sponsors. This is organized by the Muslim Student Association of Georgetown, but with the support of the Abu Ali bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. I also want to thank the Georgetown History Department for helping fund the event, as well as the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies for providing us with this very beautiful boardroom so we can uh, enjoy a uh, hopefully very interesting and enlightening scholarly discussion. Uh, before I continue, I want to make it very, very clear that uh, currently this event is being recorded by the ACMCU. Uh, so being here, uh, you are consenting to your questions possibly being recorded, although they may be edited out by the ACMCU. However, no unauthorized recordings, be it video, audio, pictures, flash photography, or otherwise, are allowed for this event. So we please ask that you really abide by that rule as protect the privacy of both our speakers and the general uh, the format of our event today. So, in the future weeks, you'll be able to find a recording of the, the full event and content uh, available on the ACMC website, as well as on YouTube and other platforms. So, so without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our speakers today. We'll begin with a couple uh, speeches. First, by Dr. Uh, James Millward. He's a professor of history here at Georgetown University in the School of Foreign Service, where he teaches Chinese, Central Asian, and World History, Eurasia, the, uh, the, the Silk World, and the history of the Qing Dynasty. He's uh, famous and well-known, regarded for his study of Uyghurs and his advocacy for the Uyghur issue, and uh, for human rights in Xinjiang. He's also studied ethnic policy in China, as well as a uh, member of the Association for the Asian Studies and Central Eurasian Studies Society. So, he will begin with a talk on the context, history of the Uyghur issue, and some of the current uh, problems that are being faced. Afterwards, we'll hear from Mr. Nuri Turco. Nuri Turco is an attorney here in Washington, D.C., specializing in regulatory compliance and anti-bribery investigations. However, he's uh, also regarded for his advocacy for the Uyghurs as a Uyghur himself, Warren Kashgar. He is a chair of the board of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, which he helped found in uh, 2004 and was the executive director of the organization until 2006. He's also published widely and is well regarded and uh, speaks very often to uh, media organizations. <coughs> After they both discuss the cost of the issue and some of the current activism and advocacy for the Uyghurs, we'll move to a moderated question and answer led by uh, Matt Schrader. He's a China analyst with the Alliance for Securing Democracy <coughs> at the German Marshall Fund. He's also a uh, Georgetown student currently pursuing a master's in uh, Asia Studies, a very well-guarded program. You should look into it if you're interested. <laughs> Uh, he writes uh, wildly as well as uh, used to work at the Jamestown China Brief at the Jamestown Foundation. So, uh, he's very correct. Yeah. So, uh, please give a round of applause for Dr. James Miller as we begin our discussion. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Moez, and thank you to the organizers, um, to the Muslim Students Association. Uh, for putting this on. It is, as Moa said, a very important um, a very important issue. I'm, I'm glad to see such a large number of people coming out at a busy time. Um, I've actually given talks on this subject in this very room uh, twice in the last six months. I think I see a couple faces who've been here before, but most people have not. And it's just a testimony to how important this is um, that news is beginning to spread around. Um, I'm going to go uh, very quickly through um, through some slides to just kind of remind us or in inform us <coughs> what is going on uh, in in Xinjiang right right now. Um, <coughs> sort of three main sort of categories of the repression uh, of Uyghurs, and, and actually, I don't. It is of course a, a Uyghur crisis as the or, or a crisis for the Uyghurs, as our flyer says. But I don't think it diminishes at all from that. Sort of, crisis status to point out um, that Kazakhs, uh, Kyrgyz, uh, and other people who are um, in Xinjiang and even engaged with studies of the region and of and other and so on are also being pulled into this, into this, into this mess. Um, and likewise, while it is targeting uh, uh, religion, 
in particular you know, Muslims. Um, it's also targeting you know, ethnicity and sort of non-religious aspects of people's identity as well. Um, so anyway, I'm going to fly uh, fly as quickly as I can through some some of the setup stuff, so we have lots of time to listen to Nuri and for discussion later on. Uh, for those of you who don't know where we're talking about, this is the Xinjiang region in the far northwest of China. It's geographically and ethnographically really uh, part of Central Asia. It was brought uh, under Beijing's control in the 18th century by the Qing Empire. Uh, and really a lot of the problems that we see in Xinjiang, you know, the Tibet, Mongolia, uh, arguably even Taiwan or Hong Kong, you know, are due to this issue of how do you, uh, of, of China inheriting the former Qing Empire without really coming to grips with what that means. How do you go from being an empire to be a, a nation state like that? <clears throat> All right, so this I think is the iconic piece of tech uh, which sort of underlies or, or rests above everything sort of going on right now, the facial recognition uh, camera. And the first category of things that has been going on in the region, really, uh, is the high-tech securitization. Um, with facial recognition cameras everywhere, uh, with checkpoints uh, all over, limiting the movement of people uh, all around, uh, but doing it in a differential way, as you can see from this, from the caption here, from a photo taken by Darren Byler, uh, Han are ushered through a regular gate while Uyghur are segregated out, or people who look uh, like Muslim minorities are segregated out and they go through much more scrutiny. Uh, and this kind of differential treatment is very common in the general securitization of the whole region. Uh, there are checkpoints everywhere, there are police vehicles everywhere, uh, there are uh, facial recognition scanners on police phones, uh, and the people's faces uh, and their ID card numbers, uh, their blood type, their DNA, uh, their iris scan, sometimes their gait, uh, that is their walking scan, that their walking print, their voice print, uh, all of this information is now being integrated into a vast database uh, and available through an AI platform to the security forces uh, at all times. There are police stations called convenience stations uh, located uh, all around cities in the region, uh, and grid policing has been implemented so that you really can't go very far without uh, running into a checkpoint or running into police of one sort or another. Armored vehicles uh, are there with you know, lots of uh, police and armed police on the ground. The scholar Darren Byler mapped out this grid of police stations around Xinjiang University, which is mainly attended by you know, not on Minorities, and you can kind of see the logic behind where they've been, where they've been located out, or where they've been situated in the region. In addition to all that bio data that I just mentioned, and uh, that's in the database, uh, data on also all aspects of behavior has been recorded through surveys, which people are required to take through their uh, workplace or through their place of living. Uh, as you can see, it includes, of course, your uh, nationality. That is your uh, ethnicity or minzu in Chinese, your work status, whether you have a passport, whether you travel, uh, whether you pray, how much you, tra you pray, uh, what your faith is, uh, all sorts of information along those lines, uh, and its score. Some of you may have heard of the sort of social credit score that's being implemented in various ways in various parts of China. This is probably the most extreme expression of that social credit score system that's now being experimented on in different places. Uh, the most intrusive, and it has some of the most uh, dire consequences because if you get a low score, and simply being a Uyghur means I think, some 10 points off the top, um, then it can control where you can go, uh, whether you can get a bank loan, where you can rent, uh, job prospects, other sorts of things like this. So a very, very intrusive system of data gathering uh, and then being implemented to control the population. So that securitization very broadly and, and uh, data gathering is one aspect of the situation. The second aspect, of course, is the camps uh, that um, you've probably heard about. <clears throat> We're still getting a sense of how many they are and how large they are. A lot of the information came available uh, or has been been picked off of websites by scholars and journalists uh, and from satellite photography. Some of it comes from 
information released by Chinese state media and government agencies themselves, such as this really iconic photo of, of what's going on. And this was circulated uh, early on in April 2017. Um, and you can see the message of this photo is quite interesting, right? This is a very different message than you get from, from the propaganda now that's talking about reform schools or um, vocational schools. Uh, this is a message showing how grim the situation is and that these potential terrorists are being treated uh, firmly, at least, right? So this was the first wave of official propaganda about these facilities to say, look what we're doing, we're cracking down on these people. And the audience, of course, is, is the Chinese population as a whole. And then just some of the images that show how we know about these camps and where they've burgeoned up. Really, since 2017 through 2018, we've got a series of before and after pictures from various places. Uh, architectural uh, scholars and analysts have been you know, working with some of these pictures to figure out the numbers of people that are being interned in these kinds of facilities. And I think our sort of best estimates right now, and conservative estimates right now, are between one and two million people, something like 11% of the Uyghur population, um, and probably and a higher percentage since of, of the male Uyghur population since men were singled out. It's not entirely men, but a lot of men. And so you can see these facilities are, are hardened. They have high walls. They have barbed wire. They have guard towers. They have police stations associated with them. And this aerial photo of the same place, the corner down here is, is that corner we were just looking at, it gives you a sense of the scale of this particular facility, the <coughs> pond. Uh, but it's been expanded even further since those pictures were taken. Likewise, this facility here in, in Hotan, just down the street from that. This may, indeed, this may indeed be a re-education center, something more like a school, perhaps a mandatory school that people are, you know, have to stay in. Uh, but just down the street is a much larger center with more prison-like facilities. And that, too, has been expanding in recent years, or in recent months. All right, so that was very, very brief. And, and we can talk more detail about what happens in these camps. I think Nuri will talk us more. Um, I gave the figure of maybe between 1 and 2 million or 1.5 million, something like that. But it, let's not forget that that's simply people who are interned in the camps through extra legal uh, methods. In other words, sort of disappeared into the camps. They don't go through the law system at all. There's no court trials. In addition to that, though, going through the legal system, and this, uh, this is from publicly available data publicized by the People's Republic of China, uh, you see that between 2016 and 2017, the numbers of people actually arrested and put through the legal system and into prison jumped by an additional 200,000, right, right? And out of the blue, and that accounts for pretty much all the increase of arrests in the entire People's Republic of China in that year. So there was a sudden spike of an additional 200,000 arrests in one year. All right, so the camps are supposed to second aspect of this. Uh, a third aspect, though, which has been going on really for several years, but has intensified in the last couple of years, is a broader targeting both of ethnicity and religion, um, things that were discouraged or perhaps you know, sort of discussed in, in public materials before, now have been effectively illegalized uh, because the, the, the state is, is, is targeting, is cracking down on what it calls extremism. But the definition of extremism has expanded and expanded and expanded to include all aspects, all, all, all sorts of everyday behavior uh, associated with being a Uyghur, associated with being, um, with being a Muslim. You can see a, give a list of some of the things which can get people locked up in, in camps here. Uh, refusing to smoke, uh, refusing to eat non-halal brands, uh, and many other sorts of things like this. Part of this is associated with a campaign that's been going on for the last couple of years to sinicize religion, to sinify religion. And this was uh, announced by uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, it's become a national policy. It affects other religions, Christianity, uh, Buddhism even as well. Uh, it seems to particularly focus in on architecture, uh, the moving of crosses and crescent and star <coughs> meals from the tops of buildings. Um, you may have heard about the uh, uh, closure of 
couple mosques in Yunnan and the threatening to tear down a big mosque in Ningxia. So it's not restricted to Xinjiang. But under that broader atmosphere, obviously, religion is singled out and targeted in, uh, in Xinjiang. And likewise, uh, concern about language, concern about in particular the Uyghur language uh, and efforts to make uh, Chinese really the only language that can be spoken in official contexts uh, in, in the region. These sorts of posters single out various kinds of headwear uh, and veils, various kinds of uh, beards and so on, which are seen as abnormal uh, and seen as signs of extremism, which can get people into the camps. The, again, these things were talked about and discouraged before, and now they are effectively illegal. <coughs> of posters, public praying, whatever that, whatever that means, uh, has been targeted really for several years. And there's been an interesting shift in the overall ideology and language whereby official materials talk about religion. Um, this is a mosque that's been closed. It has this banner poster up above the gate, uh, which reads, you know, Aidan, Aigua. So love the party, love the country. This is a truncation of a slogan that has been uh, in, in use in China really since the 1950s. And it used to say, um, love the party, love the country, love the religion, or love our religion. So they've dropped love our religion from this slogan that's been around for decades. And perhaps most, uh, well, so much of this is really distressing, but um, one thing that really indicates that this is not simply about religion, it's certainly not about extremism, has been this move to literally erase Uyghur script. Now, Uyghur is written now in a modified uh, version of Arabic script. It gives you the vowels. It's actually a very good script for the language. You know, it's what you see is what you get. Um, so it's very clear. Uh, but because of concern, it's of excessive concerns and uh, noises coming from the top about you know, Arabization, about you know, everything. Um, people have become nervous about even the Uyghur script itself. Um, so what this poster here is, it's hanging outside of a lower school, and it shows students <coughs> talking to a teacher. Uh, and it used to have both, well, Ninhao is hello um, in, in Chinese, and then it has the romanization of it there. Here, Yakshu um, Sis. It used to have that in the Uyghur script above. And someone, as you can see very heavy-handedly, has plastered over it to get rid of that Uyghur script uh, in, in the Arabic script like that. And there are lots of examples of this. Um, here's a pharmacy. Um, used to be run by somebody named Mubaka um, Haji. Well, it is still run presumably by that person. Um, but he's had to delete, again, in a fairly obvious way, the Haji. Uh, and then one of the characters Aji, which were represented in Chinese. And there are other, other examples of that sort of thing. Uh, public editorials, and there's been a big kind of movement against halal, kind of a, a, a scare, actually. I think somewhat analysis, um, analogous, perhaps, to the <coughs> creeping Sharia scare that was going around in the United States a few years ago, perhaps still is, um, about sort of cre creeping halalization. And the irony is that halal brands uh, had had a little bit of a problem in China because they had a reputation of being clean and safe uh, after so many food scandals. Um, and uh, so there was an issue of people just slapping halal on all sorts of things and, and the state having trouble controlling that and so on. But now they've gone completely the other way um, and they're saying that you know, anything other than you know, meat from the butchers you cannot call halal. And, and so there's been a move about this. Um, here, there, we have a uh, editorial by somebody named Yusuf, uh, who's trying to argue in the editorial uh, that um, not eating pork uh, is somehow backward and non-scientific. If you're a modern scientific person, you recognize that at the molecular level, lamb and pork are really the same, so it doesn't really matter if you, you, know, if you eat it. They're both edible meats. So that's an argument put forward, and I think this is a Global Times editorial. Uh, so you see the kind of the, the, the thrust of this campaign, it often reaches a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous levels. Um, 
likewise here, there's been a, uh, an argument here being put forward by in an interview with uh, the mayor of, yes, yeah, the mayor of Arunchi, uh, who's arguing that the, the Uyghur people, who are Central Asians who speak a Turkic language um, related to medieval Turkic, um, of, the, of the Turkic cognate, um, and actually very closely, almost mutually recognizable by people in modern Turkey today, he's arguing that it has nothing to do with the ancient Turkic language, but rather has somehow derived from Chinese. Okay, and people are putting this sort of argument out. So there's an effort to uh, sort of use false history to actually try to you know, erase the very obvious historical background of, of Uyghurs and of other minorities in China too, and say that everything is really derived from some kind of core uh, Chinese sort of Zhonghua ethnicity uh, in the ancient past. All right, so finally, how did we get to this? Uh, and here I'll try to explain a little bit maybe what's happened in the political and ideological field to explain why somebody could think it's a good idea to do these sorts of things uh, in, in Xinjiang. And so one of the points where we would begin would be the collapse of the USSR, which had a system of organized, a top-down system of organizing ethnic groups and national groups uh, that the Chinese system is quite similar to and was in many of its ways borrowed from initially. So when the USSR broke up and was rendered into its national republics, this made many people in China nervous. Perhaps for the wrong reasons, perhaps it's a false diagnosis of the problems of the USSR. But in any case, it kind of set a marker there. Uh, so some discussions began about this. Uh, now, uh, you could call it separatism, but certainly sort of un unrest and dissent uh, in Xinjiang, Tibet, and Inner Mongolia, and among some other groups has really been common uh, in China uh, all along. Uh, and certainly the treatment of non-Han ethnic groups, in particular Uyghurs and Tibetans, uh, has never been, never been good. I think it's probably never been as bad as it is right now for the, for the Uyghurs. Um, but in 2008 in Tibet, in 2009 uh, in Xinjiang, there were uh, riots at, at a fairly large scale. Um, and again, this was uh, a, set off alarm bells for the leadership uh, in Beijing, and a lot of discussion ensued over the next few years uh, about whether the actual policies of organizing ethnic groups uh, in China were themselves responsible for the fact that uh, what what the Chinese leadership saw as a, as a problem that um, that ethnic difference hadn't just dis disappeared over the decades. They thought that you know, everything should really come together, and the fact that it hadn't, and that people were still maintaining their different identities, was seen as a seen as a problem. So there was a lot of debate about that on the internet and in party journals and in academic circles and so on. Uh, 2013 and 2014, uh, there was a series of particularly prominent attacks, relatively small scale, except for Kunming, where I think 40 some people were killed um, in, in knife attacks. So you know, serious attacks that uh, Western observers uh, agree to you know, call terrorism. Um, a lot of the stuff which Chinese tends to call terrorism um, any kind of unrest gets called terrorism in the Xinjiang context, but these are you know, clearly uh, following that sort of uh, playbook. Uh, and the reaction from the Chinese Communist Party was, uh, was, was immediate and has been quite severe. Uh, there was a new campaign against terrorism announced, a strike hard campaign called the People's War on Terror, which was rolled out with a lot of uh, fanfare. Uh, Xi Jinping convened a central ethnic work conference where these kinds of issues would be talked about. Um, and in it, he, uh, he signaled some changes in the overall approach to uh, ethnicity in China. Um, he mentioned that r rather than just material concerns, the issue of ethnicity would have to involve spiritual or psychological uh, concerns as, as well. And what that was, that was a way of saying that simply by raising standards of living and uh, economic development alone, now the party was recognizing that this would not solve as what they saw as the problem of ethnic difference. Uh, that would have to affect people's minds as well, do something to change people's minds. Uh, and they rolled out uh, a, you know, series, a slogan of four identifications um, that all ethnicities have to do, the ancestral land, uh, or the Chinese nation, 
Chinese culture with the socialist growth of Chinese characteristics. So a much tighter focus on, on Chinese, on either Zhongguo or Zhonghua identity. The scientization of religion uh, policy started in around 2016, as I mentioned before. And in, in the same year, Chen Chenguo, who was the first party secretary uh, in Tibet, and had a reputation of being kind of a fixer for these kinds of restive areas, was transferred from Tibet to Xinjiang. Uh, and he launched, and, and he had something of a, of a blank check for securitization, uh, and launched this massive program that I mentioned before. Uh, the budget went up something like 250% in one year for security expenditures. Uh, and they hired something like 100,000 new security personnel, many at sort of very low levels um, and actually many Uyghur uh, and other minorities as well. Uh, and he began to build uh, these camps from around 2017. Now, the camps have some precedences. Uh, smaller versions of them have been around for, for more years. Uh, in Tibet, there's some, some examples of these, and also in Xinjiang as well. <coughs> What's different now is the massive scaling up you know, to levels of hundreds of thousands of people are in them. Um, and also different now, although not, well, not entirely new, but, um, but much more uh, audible, uh, is this kind of rationale for the re-education program, which uses these really terrifying metaphors of weed killer um, you know, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and the idea is uh, that the sick as well as the, the, the well as, as well as the sick need to be treated. Right? People need to be uh, inoculated against uh, extremism. Uh, the whole field needs to be treated with the weed killer uh, in order to get the weeds. Um, those kinds of metaphors coming out, again, out of state media like this. Um, and these are, of course, one of the things that have really alarmed people so much because it's a very similar metaphor kind of, uh, it's a very similar metaphor to you know, sorts of things that we heard during the Holocaust and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, as well as in, in, in uh, Chinese context with regard to Falun Gong um, and people who need and political prisoners, so poisonous weeds, for example. That, that, uh, all right, I'm conscious of my time. Uh, I'll finish up very quickly here. Uh, the official rationale for what's going on in these facilities, which, which may include some that are more like schools, some that are much more like prisons. But the official rationale actually uh, dovetails very nicely with this kind of, um, with this kind of metaphor. Right? Um, the idea is that people need to learn all of this, and they need to have their psychology changed uh, through this re-education process. Uh, they'll be learning about China, learning Chinese, uh, and then of course, it said that they would, they should learn a vocational skill uh, as well. Now, the implication of this is that these are poor people, people who don't have a job, the unemployed, the unsophisticated, um, who are most likely to be subject to extremist ideology, sneaking in. That's kind of you know, the argument for all of this. Um, but in fact, the people who have been, although although people who fit that that description have been put in the camps as well. Uh, so has really the entire upper stratum of Uyghur uh, intellectual and cultural society. And this is just you know, five, five names, including university presidents and prominent scholars. Um, uh, but there's a list now that people have compiled of names we know of some, I think it's about 300 or more intellectual and cultural figures who have been disappeared uh, into the camps. And so, and, and, and as we noticed in that, um, in that survey uh, that I showed you before, foreign travel, having a passport, you know, those are actually probably the most, the, 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 the aspects most of concern to authorities. Um, and if you think about what that means is, you know, who has a passport, who's traveled abroad among the Uyghurs and other, and other groups. Uh, these are intellectuals, there's people who are educated, they're elites, they're business elites, they're people who can go on vacation, right? Um, and, Ironically, these are precisely the people who you know, China could point to that would actually show the success of the last few decades of policies of uh, economic 
uh, uh, raising standards of living and so on, right? I mean, these are global and, and national elites. They speak Chinese very well. They probably also speak English and so on. And so those are the people who are absolutely targeted. And, and many, of course, Uyghurs now have been, uh, and others have been stuck abroad and you know, don't dare go home because they know the first thing that will happen is they'll be detained and put in the camps. And then over to, to your... <coughs> Thank you so much for organizing this event. I'm particularly grateful to Noah for uh, putting this event together in such a short period of time. Um, and following Jim to make anything um, sensible is a impossible proposition, but I will try my best to uh, um, uh, uh, give you some anecdotal information. Um, the Weavers are experiencing uh, uh, the, the darkest period in their modern history. Uh, even though the Uyghur people have experienced something similar throughout the history, but this, this scale of magnitude of what is happening in the last two years uh, is extraordinary. <coughs> U.S. State Department uh, recently uh, put out a figure, uh, 800,000 to 2 million people uh, have been uh, detained. Um, some of the uh, uh, U.S. government officials, uh, both in the administration and the the Congress have described the, um, the mass detention as the largest internment of ethnic minorities set since the Second World War. And also, uh, um, the international uh, pressure has been mounting, particularly since last um, August, uh, after the, uh, the UN panel uh, publicly challenged the Chinese government. Uh, the, the Uyghur issue, uh, both politically and uh, societally, drawing uh, a lot of attention. Uh, in my lifetime, I never thought that I would see this level of media scrutiny. Uh, but the, the interest, public interest, uh, being expressed in mild form uh, by various government officials uh, and others, uh, concerned others, have not really translated this momentum into a policy action. So I'd like to take this opportunity to um, uh, go over a few questions, uh, and then I will make some recommendations at, 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 towards the end. But first of all, um, is this really a vocational training? Uh, Jim described uh, or showed us what kind of people that, they, that the Chinese government is currently detained in those uh, detention facilities. Uh, Associated French press journalist Ben Dole, uh, according to the Chinese government's um, documents, uh, quoted uh, a, a, the official statement, it, which says, teach like a school, be managed like a military, and defend it like a prison. So, and also uh, the same report uh, uh, by Dole, uh, describes the Chinese official lines by setting up these camps, a quote, break Uyghur lineage, break their roots, break their connections, and break their origin, unquote. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, uh, Chinese government denied the existence and punitive nature of these uh, camps until late last year uh, by showing uh, some happy faces. Uh, they st it's still, still happening. The cover story, the narrative has been restructured, but the fact remains that these are uh, prison camps. Um, the recently uh, uh, very senior level U.S. government official uh, during the travel in Asia stated that the Chinese government can call it whatever they want it, uh, but we need to call these camps what they are. They are internment camps created to wipe out the cultural religious identity of minority communities. And uh, Ambassador Brombeck and also said the Chinese is at war with face, and it's a war that they will not win. What is Chinese government's fear of Uyghurs naming their children Mohammed? So the, um, uh, the official uh, government statements, particularly expressed by the United States government, and the, uh, the reports done by uh, uh, various media organizations, witness accounts, and government's own uh, publicly available documents shows that these are not really uh, 
uh, educational facilities. And also, um, if, if they are building educational facilities, there should be some, um, somebody needs to stop, but uh, uh, various think tanks and media reports uh, describe the increase, the expansion of these camps. An Australian think tank last, last year reported, um, uh, after surveying 28 camps, the expansion uh, rate within less than two years of period is about 465 percent. Around the same time, uh, Reuters um, uh, reported that uh, of those 82 uh, prison camps that they identified through satellite imagery, um, 36 of them expanded as the area the size of 140 soccer fields. And BBC reported late last year the Chinese government is building the largest prison camps just outside of Urumqi. Um, so it is expanding, it's still in the process of building. Um, uh, so so Chinese can call it 15 times that uh, it's a re-education camps, but you don't re-educate someone with the medical degrees, uh, honorary doctor's degrees, world-known scholars that uh, Jim was showing earlier. And also, uh, are these uh, camps are really set to prevent uh, terrorism. Um, but the Chinese government has a few stated goals. One of them is they try to uh, achieve social stability, uh, uh, weeding out uh, three forces, extremists, terrorists, and separatists. But when you look at the uh, mindset, the rhetoric, uh, that the Chinese government has been publicly making in, uh, in, in public arena uh, it should make you concerned about their true intentions. Last November, China's ambassador to the United States, Sui Tenkai, a very high level uh, foreign policy uh, uh, individual in the Chinese uh, government, he ridiculed the Chinese, uh, U.S. government and other Western uh, governments by stating why the U.S. is using bombs and drones to go after terrorists. We Chinese are trying to re-educate most of them, turning, trying to turn them into normal persons who can go back to a normal life. So the Chinese government, in a way, uh, engaging in human engineering, uh, as if the social engineering that they have launched, implemented uh, in the 90s, 2000, were not enough. Um, <clears throat> and also, um, um, what kind of impact that the, uh, uh, the ongoing crisis is having uh, both uh, the Uyghurs both inside and outside of China? Um, oftentimes, we just focus on uh, the individuals who are detained. But, um, we don't talk enough about the ones outside of China, outside of those camps, and also individuals like myself live in a free societies. Uh, Jim uh, showed us some uh, images. The Chinese government effectively created a police state. Uh, those Uyghurs who did not uh, uh, locked up in the camps are going through a uh, surveillance state. Uh, it, uh, one of the American experts who specialize in Xinjiang Uyghur issues likened uh, uh, the current environment to that of North Korea, even even reviving the uh, North Korean situation. So um, uh, anyone uh, anyone can be taken into prison camps based on those uh, uh, questions that they have to answer: uh, travel history, uh, family connections, past writings, uh, past expression of. Uh, their appreciation of the culture, uh, Uyghur religion, uh, or being devout uh, Muslim, uh, and even in private, can be uh, the reason for them to take into the camps. So uh, psychologically, emotionally, uh, the Uyghur people have been uh, broken uh, in the society. And outside of China, the Chinese influence uh, has been also exported uh, in countries like Australia, the United States, and Europe the Chinese government quite comfortably uh, reaching out to uh, Uyghur immigrants, Uyghur community members, uh, pressuring them to stay silent, otherwise there will be repercussions, uh, retaliations against his family members. So um, in response to these uh, atrocities and crisis, uh, 
the United States government has started to speak out uh, since last April. Initially, um, a senior official, Laura Stone from the State Department, suggested that global Magnitsky should be looked at uh, and implemented, and that followed by uh, Senator Rubio and others at the U.S. Congress publicly uh, making uh, recommendations. So I'm going to go over a few um, things that are happening uh, as res in response to the, um, <coughs> the atrocities taking place in Uyghur's homeland, East Turkestan. Um, before I move on, and I'd like to uh, briefly talk about why uh, uh, certain countries and governments are not really uh, taking up this uh, cause. Uh, it, as, as things stand, the United States government has been, uh, regardless of what is your opinion towards Trump administration, they should be given credit for uh, what they have been doing on behalf of the leaders uh, in both the legislative and, and executive branch of the government. Uh, some of the, uh, the Chinese government's policies, uh, especially the influence campaign around the world, have been so effective, uh, particularly in developing countries and Muslim countries, and some Muslim governments and some Muslim people around the world actually come up in defense of the Chinese government's treatment of the Uyghurs. Even Palestine last November here at the uh, uh, UPR, uh, Universal Periodic Review in Geneva, uh, defended uh, phrased uh, Chinese government's treatment of the Uyghur uh, Muslims. And also recently, uh, Saudi Prince, uh, future custodian of the two Hollywood mosques, uh, went to Beijing and, and publicly uh, phrased Chinese government's treatment of the Uyghur Muslims. The legitimate question for him could be, what is wrong, what is wrong with my name? His name is Mohammed bin Salman. Very simple. Mm -hmm. And also, um, is this okay to grow a beer? He would have been a pr prime target in the Chinese government's uh, mind, uh, based on this de-extremification measure that they implemented uh, in April 2017. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman would, could have been uh, subject to uh, detention facilities. So even that kind of mild form of uh, response, expressions of concern, have not been done by uh, some government officials uh, that enjoys a certain level of um, uh, influence over Chinese politics. Uh, to date, uh, only uh, Turkey um, and Malaysian Prime Minister to be, uh, Enver Ibrahim, uh, publicly expressed concern. But let's don't forget, uh, expressing concerns is one thing, but taking governmental action is another. So we, we've been hearing people expressing concerns in the last two years almost. So where is the action? Where is the outcry? Is this because the Uyghurs happen to be wrong type of Muslim? China happened to be wrong type of adversary that you take on? So where is the outcry? If anything like it, remotely close to what is happening to Uyghurs is happening in other countries to other people, uh, we would have seen UN Security Council call for emergency meeting. We would have seen ambassadors being recalled. But we haven't seen anything like it uh, to this day. Uh, just last week, uh, Another government official uh, on, uh, at the event where they were releasing the human rights report um, without making specific reference to Nazi Germany said since 1930s, the world has not seen anything like it. So, um, so the narrative is pretty clear. Uh, I personally losing patience. I, you know, I work with deadlines every day. Uh, I like to get things done. Uh, being part of this uh, public advocacy campaign myself since last spring. Uh, uh, I'm just dying to see somebody uh, show a Churchill-like leadership and, um, and do something about this. So um, the United States government is considering two things, uh, namely, one, uh, there are two pending uh, legislation in the U.S. Congress. Uh, one is called Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2019. It was uh, introduced uh, by Senator Rubio and Menendez of New Jersey, one Republican, one uh, uh, Democrat. Uh, and then there's the companion bill. Uh, currently, this bill has about 25 sponsors. I checked the status last night. Uh, it has 25 sp sponsors that include some of the presidential can candidates, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Gillibrand, uh, 
So um, it, it, when you look at it, it's pretty nice uh, uh, composition of bipartisan support. And also there's a companion bill, uh, which is also uh, <coughs> receiving uh, broad support. This bill was introduced by uh, Christopher Smith, Republican from New Jersey, and Tom Sozi from New York, a Democrat. This bill is currently have 39 sponsors, including Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, we hope that this bill will, uh, will pass sometime in the next few months. Uh, if Nancy Pelosi uh, includes uh, Ilham, Ilham Umar, the new congresswoman has been making headlines lately. So is Rashida Talia. Uh, so, uh, so there's something is happening in the U.S. Congress. And also in addition to this bill, uh, uh, these two members of Congress, uh, Brad Sherman and Ted Yoho, uh, introduced their own version of uh, the Uyghur Policy Act. Uh, <coughs> this one has 12 spots. Eventually the two bills might be merged because uh, there's some overlap in the, uh, uh, in the text. So, um, so what do you do? You you could do a few things. If you see if you don't see your your mem uh, your congressman or senator in this list, uh, I'd like you to make a phone call and, and ask them when they're going to sign on. Uh, we only have 39 sponsors on the House side, 25 in the Senate. Uh, this need to be uh, done sometime soon. Even though the U.S. government cannot go to China to punish a government official, this would be a historic and very significant uh, event uh, to both uh, Uyghurs here and Uyghurs in China. This has very specific provisions, uh, including uh, let me see. Uh, it has very specific provisions that could be immediately implemented. Uh, including uh, the uh, <coughs> implementation of the Global Magnitsky Act. You probably heard this term. I can explain to you what that is, um, uh, maybe during the Q&A. But uh, this is one of the tools that the U.S. government has its, its disposal to punish human rights abusers around the world. Uh, it's not a punitive, it's, but it's more like a deterrent uh, effect-oriented uh, uh, legal tools that will restrict uh, human rights abusers' travel uh, uh, freedom of movement and free bank accounts if they have any in the United States. And also this will appoint a uh, 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 special coordinator at the State Department, which will be very similar to the one that has been vacant for the Tibetan people at the State Department. Uh, but this is all very uh, significant uh, uh, provisions in the uh, uh, proposed law. And also, um, uh, one uh, other thing that, um, getting, that, is, that is getting a lot of support is the last one, um, incur, uh, requesting or requiring the law enforcement to investigate the Chinese influence harass, harassment campaign of Uyghur Americans or permanent residents in the country. So this is a very significant uh, legislative development. In addition to your support of these bills, um, I would like you to also um, use your um, uh, uh, community uh, in various Muslim communities or others to advocate uh, the others to get involved. Uh, under the normal circumstance, we would have seen <coughs> a movement in the various U.S. campuses that we have not seen in the same way that people show support to uh, the Palestine cause in the past. So. Um, <clears throat> and also organizing this kind of events could be very helpful. And uh, finally, I have to say this very shamelessly, uh, that uh, we need a lot of uh, financial support. We means the organization that I'm affiliated with. Uh, we currently lack of resources and manpower. We need to have at least 10 full-time staff to work on the cause right now, but uh, we have about five full-time, two part-time, currently paid by uh, NED uh, annual grant, research grant, and the private donations. I will uh, end my presentation here. Uh, I enjoy uh, Q&A much more than delivering speech, so uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have to help you to understand the crisis.